Are we fixed? All right. Whew. So now we get to start all over again. And if I was a real astrologer, um, I would take a quick look at the chart for the moment. And, um, and although I don't have a horizon on this chart, um, I would see that we are working on a sun moon square. I think that's right. The moon is in Scorpio. Anyhow, welcome again for the second time. For those of you online, couldn't, couldn't hear, but welcome to Astrology Night at Soul Food Coffee House in downtown Redmond, Washington. This is the real downtown Redmond. And um, I'm Rick Levine, and tonight we're going to take a little bit of a uh, diversion from what I normally do, although I will talk a little bit about the month ahead. I'm going to mostly focus on the, the bigger picture. And um, I would remind all of you who are here and those of you who happen to you know, pop in online that the February monthly detailed you know, aspect by aspect throughout the month is also available on, on YouTube. So I'm not cheating you out of any information. Instead, I'm trying to give you more because I did promise a 2024 overview. Now, 2024 is, um, is a, like, like February actually, 2024 is a bit of a sleeper of, of a month and a sleeper of a year. And what I mean by that is that when you look at 2024, it doesn't seem to be all that active on the surface, like the month of February, it just kind of seems to be another, another year, another month, but it's not, neither are. February, as, um, as I wrote about and talked about on the February forecast on YouTube, uh, February is very much a powerhouse of a month. In fact, I always assign a few words uh, to kind of give an image for the overview for the month. And my, my words for the overview of February 2024 was power surge. <laughs> and we sometimes think of Jupiter as the planet of power, and in some ways it is. But real power is, it comes from, from Pluto. Uh, Pluto has... Uh, a, a, Newton had a concept that he called tangential or angular momentum of gravity. And, and for those people who say, well, Pluto, the gravitational effect of Pluto, and of course, gravity may not be all that important when we look at the astrological effects. But it turns out that, that the tangential gravity coming off of Pluto is, um, is the inertia is even greater than the moon. It has something to do with the you know, with the uh, speed and the distance that it covers. And the point is that when it comes to wealth, money, we think of Venus, we can think of Jupiter also as expanding that wealth. But when it comes to real wealth, we're talking Pluto. And in fact, a plutocracy is a government by not just the wealthy, but the extremely wealthy with wealth that's so great that it's hidden, and here we get to the real meaning of Pluto, because Pluto, as the traditional lord of the underworld, Pluto is basically about everything that is not on the surface. It's everything that is hidden. In modern psychodynamic uh, or depth psychology, Pluto actually is the planet of the unconscious. And one might say all the planets outside of Saturn have to do with the unconscious, and that really would be true. But Pluto is kind of the keeper of the hidden realms. And for the ancients, having a lot of money wasn't the real wealth. The real wealth was underground. It was the person who owned the gold mine, the diamond mine, the silver mine, the copper mine, all these things, the even tin, all these metals, and the, the, these were things that were underground, they were hidden. And the real wealthy, the extremely, extremely wealthy is wealthy, are wealthy beyond our, our imagination. And so Pluto is really the planet of power and of change that is not like the leaves falling off the tree. The leaves fall off the tree every year. That is change, but that is a cyclical change. 
And the cycle of Pluto is so long that it really appears to be a one-time change. In fact, we think of the cycle of the, um, the re- incarnation cycle. And I'm always intrigued by that word because people talk about reincarnation, except you can't have reincarnation without disincarnation. I mean, think about it. It's, it's, and everyone says, do you believe in reincarnation? And no one says, well, do you believe in disincarnation? Um, and I've been trying to replace in my vocabulary the words birth and death with disincarnation or reincarnation or incarnation and disincarnation. What does this have to do with 2024 and with February? Well, Pluto is on center stage right now, most obviously because Pluto is the slowest moving planet. It takes about 248 years to make one complete journey around the sun. Meanwhile, we're taking one year to make a journey around the sun. Pluto takes 248 years that basically is four times a millennium. And it just so happens that right now, Pluto is returning to the same point in the sky where it was during the Declaration of Independence. And just like an individual experiences a birthday every year, a solar return, when the sun seems to be returned to where it was when we were born, and just as at the age of 29-ish, 29 and a half, we each experience our first Saturn birthday, our Saturn return, and we grow up, we become an adult. And in fact, that happens again at around age 50, 58-ish, give or take a year, depending upon um, your individual chart. The Saturn return, like a solar return like a birthday is a moment of a death and rebirth it's the end of one year of our lives and the beginning of the next we make a wish we blow out the candle why do we do that because any witch any magician will tell you that the real magic occurs not when you make the intention not when you have the thought but when you release it you can't have a wish fulfilled while you're holding on too tightly and that's why the custom of making a wish, we think of it as so, you know, it has nothing to do with reality, it's just a custom. But the fact of the matter is that we're all practicing witchy magic when we have our six or seven year old or 30 year old light a candle or light 30 candles, make a wish, which is really just stating an intention. And when you blow it out, it releases the energy. And that's where the transmission of whatever that magic happens out there in the universe. Now, why are we talking about this? Because we are experiencing a Pluto return, not individually. None of us will remember a, our individual Pluto return because it only happens once every 248 years. So the United States of America right now is at a position in its evolution of basically having to grow up, of having to take and experience the power of the end, Pluto, death, deconstruction, and then rebirth, reincarnation, reconstruction. And this is the background of what's happening out there um, and has been for, for multiple years, because when you talk about a cycle that's a 250 year cycle, it doesn't happen in a moment. It's not like flipping a light switch on or off. It happens in that moment. It's a gradual approach and then, and then culmination and then a beginning of a dissipation. So in the midst of all of this, it should be noted that 250 years ago, 247 years ago, Pluto moved from the sign of Capricorn, where it had been for a couple of decades, into the sign of Aquarius. And it should be noted that just a couple of weeks ago, Pluto, once again, as it does every quarter of a millennium, moved from Capricorn into Aquarius. Now, Capricorn and Aquarius are interesting signs in as much as they seem so different because Capricorn is about structure. Capricorn is about banks and bridges and institutions and fundamental 
things that are reality, stability, status quo, conservatism. And I don't necessarily mean just political conservatism. I mean, holding on to things to make them last. Because Capricorn is about mastery of the three-dimensional world so that we get to where we're going. Capricorn is the ultimate survivor. It finishes what it starts. And therefore, as Pluto moved through Capricorn from about 2008 all the way through this year, and again, the switching between signs is gradual because all the outer planets, all the planets move in this back and forth motion because the Earth is moving around inside it. And so Pluto tipped into Aquarius last March just for a quick little visit, what's this like? And then it went back into Capricorn in May. It stayed there until January, just a couple of weeks ago, where it's now back in Aquarius. It'll be here in, in Aquarius until September. It tips back into Capricorn again, just a snudgeon. That's a metric snudgeon, not, a, not an English snudgeon. Just for a little, little bit of time. And then by the end of the year, it's back in Aquarius, where it then stays for nearly 20 years. Now, when a planet changes signs, it's like, it's like us changing what we're wearing. And what we're wearing really uh, has impact on what we do and how people see us and how we interact in the outer world. You know, if I'm dressed in my ski pants and, you know, and, and parka and ski boots on, that's very different than how I might dress either to go to bed at night or undress or to go to some club on a Friday night. And planets, as they move into a sign, it's like they're changing their clothing. Um, I, I, and, and so as Pluto, which has spent for um, a, almost a couple of decades in the sign of Capricorn, Pluto is about death regeneration. Pluto is nihilism in the true Nietzschean sense of nihilism really is about taking those things that are at the top of the mountain, the most important things, and making them unimportant, sending them to the bottom where they then have to come back up. It's devaluation of that which is important. In fact, um, the idea of God is dead is like ultimate nihilism because it takes something that is so important and it devalues it and it has to be recreated. So. As Pluto moved through Capricorn, a matter of fact, when Pluto first moved into Capricorn in 2008, can anyone think of the biggest event in 2008? The financial collapse, the housing collapse. And you think about it, banks are the ultimate or one of the ultimate Capricornian things because we depend upon the stability of that to build the entire economy. And it was interesting that as Pluto moved into Aquarius, Last year in March, April, May, we had collapse of banks that were associated with cyber currency and um, the um, Silicon Valley Bank. I can't think of, maybe that was the name of it. But again, this is like the last, you know, kind of screamings of Pluto and Capricorn needing to finish its work. In the United States, one of the most fundamental under underpinnings of our country is the Constitution. And anyone who's paying attention can see, regardless of what the outcome of what's been going on for the last half dozen years and will probably be going on for the next handful of years, is that our Constitution is being deconstructed and reconstructed. Whether you call it a revolution, a civil war, or just a cultural change, this is something that's not only happening here, but it's impacting us around the world. So where... The, I, the most important thing at the fundamental basis of 2024 is that it's the first year in a couple of hundred years, God, almost 250 years, where Pluto is in Aquarius for almost the entire year. And again, I started out saying that the two signs, Capricorn and Aquarius, are peculiar because they're next door to each other. Uh, Robert Frost um, wrote a poem, uh, Good Fences Make Good Neighbors. Well, there's a vast difference between the stability, the status quo, um, the practicality, the groundedness, the earth. Um, Capricorn is an earth sign um, of, of Capricorn compared to the 
Um, Capricorn deals with the past and holding on to the status quo, whereas Aquarius deals with the future. It deals with not necessarily just knowing the rules, Capricorn, the law, I always like to say gravity. It's not just a good idea, it's the law. <laughs> However, if you know the rules, you can fly a several hundred ton plane and break the apparent law of gravity because science is ultimately kind of this dance between the stability and knowing the laws of Capricorn and then deconstructing them and then breaking them and having a breakthrough into something in the future. So Aquarius is the sign of the future. Aquarius is technology. Aquarius is not practical. It's not an earth sign. In fact, Aquarius is the water bearer. But here's the oddity about Aquarius. It's not a water sign either. What carries water? The air. There's always moisture in the air, and that moisture is necessary because it conducts electricity. And the symbol for Aquarius are those like wavy lines. Um, if we look here at the um, screen, uh, we can see the sun at 13 degrees, 45 minutes of Aquarius. The symbol for Aquarius is those like wavy lines. It's, it's like water, but it's really almost like electricity. And the thing is, that our body is built on electricity. Our nerves, our nervous system is electrical. In fact, every time a signal goes from the brain to any part of our body, every time the heart makes a beat and sends signals throughout the body, it's done via electrical impulses, which happen based upon a sodium-potassium exchange. And that sodium-potassium exchange happens in every nerve cell as the electrical current goes down the nerve cell, but you know what? It can't occur unless it's wet. Water is required for that electricity to be conducted. And in fact, anyone who spent a winter, you know, in, in Norway or in Minnesota, where I lived for a number of years, where in the wintertime it gets so cold and there's no moisture because the moisture is locked up. And you know that if you go to turn a light switch on, you take your hand to the light switch quickly, because if you go slowly, you get a shock. Or when you meet someone, hi, my name is Rick, and you stick out your hand, you get a shock. Because every time you touch something that grounds it, it releases that pent up, built up electrical charge that if you lived in southern Italy or, or in Bali uh, or in Goa, where I just spent the last couple of months where it's warm or hot and humid, there's no electrical buildup. It's like there's this psychic feeling, emotional flowing energy in the tropics, in the, in the wet tropics, that's very different from the northern latitudes. This is Aquarius. And Aquarius requires emotion. That's the water but it's communicated via shocks and electricity in the air. All right, so the weird thing, cycling all the way back to where I started, about Aquarius or Capricorn and Aquarius living next door to each other, their neighbors with a good fence in between, is that traditionally they're both ruled by Saturn. In other words, in astrology, every planet relates to a sign. Every sign relates to a planet. In the ancient tradition, there's this thing called the Thema Mundi, which is kind of the rule of the world of how, how the, all the astrology planets are connected. I don't want to go into that right now. Um, but in the Thema Mundi, um, the sun connects with Leo and the moon connects with, um, with, with Cancer. And then going out from that Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, you go one sign at a time, and, and all those planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, all connect with two signs. One is a, called the daytime, and one is a nighttime version of the same energy. So Saturn was the ruler or was at home in Capricorn and Aquarius. But when Uranus was discovered, when? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Uranus, the planet that we moderners connect with Aquarius, was discovered around the time of the American and French revolutions when Pluto was in Aquarius. And the sun, and I'm sorry, the planet Uranus was given to Aquarius. And most astrologers 
will say that, uh, that Uranus is the modern ruler of Aquarius or Uranus is at home in Aquarius or that Saturn and Uranus are the co-rulers of Aquarius. However you want to say it, that's fine. And there is a Uranian futuristic, electrical, lightning, sudden, um, unexpected aspect of Aquarius. It is the planet of technology and of conceptual, intellectual, mental air sign breakthroughs. But it also has an aspect of Saturn to it. And as such, as Pluto now is moving from Capricorn, where it's deconstructed and created an upheaval that was very gradual over years that kind of destroyed what we thought we thought we knew about history, about banks, about governments, about how, about how democracy works, about all these different things and, 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 and very fundamental things that at that same time as Pluto moves from Capricorn to Aquarius, it's like, I'm done with that aspect. If you think of Pluto back in Sagittarius, that was a 15, 20 year period of time where evangelical you know, Christianity in particular was all over the airwaves. It was the Jim Bakers and the, I can't even think of who, but, but as you watch Pluto go through these different signs, you see a different tenor of cultural kind of something happening and then it being changed. So we are at the very front end of a nearly 20 year period when Pluto moving through Aquarius is going to kind of bring down and take apart everything that we thought we knew that was intellectual, academic, technological, and has to do with what we call the community. You see, Aquarius um, is, is, is a collective sign, so it has to do with the people. Well, when we say that the Constitution, which was written, the United States Constitution, was written when, when Pluto was in Aquarius, this was a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. <laughs> All right. Now, of course, there's a little problem here. And that, well, there's two problems here. One is that there's government in the way of that. And the other problem is the people. <laughs> and so whether or not this experiment turns out to be something that actually works over a longer period of time, we will kind of begin to get more clues as Pluto moves through Aquarius. But we're getting strong inklings of it now. And we're also being confronted as Pluto moves into Aquarius. In fact, it was last March when Pluto first tipped into Aquarius when overnight um, AI became a thing. Now it had been a thing. I mean, I have a book written about artificial intelligence from the 80s, from the 1980s. So it's not like this is a new concept, but all of a sudden it exploded um, onto uh, our sense of what we thought reality was. And, and it is my and many people's projections that AI will change us more than the web did, more than the internet did, more than individual personal computers did. And those are all huge technological changes. And so this, the whole concept of AI, I think is part of what we're gonna see unfold in, in major ways over the next year, 2024, with Pluto and Aquarius, but it's still just the early phases of a much longer trajectory. Another thing that I think we're gonna see more of not only this year, 2024, but also a longer trajectory is we have all these initials. We have um, uh, AI and we have ET, <laughs> which, regardless of where you fall on whatever your individual beliefs are, they're going to be rattled. Because as we move through this Pluto in Aquarius period of time, this stuff's going to explode in ways that we just don't know, can't even, can't even begin to, um, to, to imagine. Um, in fact, next weekend, I'm going to be down in Los Angeles uh, teaching at the Conscious Life Expo, which is a crazy conglomeration of um, astrology is like one little piece of, of um, this whole, what some people call the consciousness movement, what some, some people might call woke 
ism without the judgment that politically it seems to have. But um, but there will be people there who are the world experts um, in uh, what used to be UFO and is you know now UAE or whatever um, uh, unidentified area a, aerial experience. When did, I, I don't know. Phenomena, UAP. Okay, unidentified aerial phenomena. Anyhow, they're going to be um, the. Um, that's going to be a large part of this um, lifestyle: crystals, yoga, um, uh, astrology, uh, other forms of divination, tarot. I mean, it's all kinds of things. Um, and and as I like to say, and Fruit Loops and wind chimes. <laughs> I, I've told the story many times. It's it's a two sentence story, and it's worth it. When, I, when my daughter, um, who's now in her 40s, was about 10 years old, I took her to what was then called the Whole Life Expo, very similar to Conscious Life Expo. So Conscious Life Expo attracts close to 10,000 people, and this was quite a bit smaller back then. So she was about 10 years old, and we went and we walked through all the displays and all this crazy stuff and cool stuff and whatever. And in the car on the way home, I said, so, so Faith, what'd you think? And she said, oh, it was great. She said, but I had the feeling like half the stuff there was like really important to know about and was really like, like, wow. And the other half of the stuff was just bullshit. And you know, you weren't allowed to know which was which. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's still true. OK, so back to 2024. Um, so in 2024, we're, we're, we're basically um, stepping into this Pluto and Aquarius thing that's going to be with us for the next couple of decades. All right, that's the background of everything else. Oh, and I should say in passing, and I'm only going to say this in passing because I do a deep dive on this on the February forecast that's already posted on, on YouTube. Um, I posted it yesterday and it already has upwards to 20,000 views on it. So I know many of you have watched it. So um, the, th the thing about February is that the personal planets, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, these are the planets that are Earth-like, meaning that they're close um, uh, astronomically, cosmic, cosmologically, they're close to Earth. Mercury is how we think, it's how we talk, it's how we interact. It's our movement, uh, intellectual movement. Venus is what we like, it's what we're attracted to. Venus is how we get pleasure, it's, what, it's, it, it's how we love, it's, it, it's, it's, how we, um, it, it, it's how we take care of, I'm doing this as if this is representative of touching things that are nice. It's how, it's, it's how we gain pleasure in the world. Venus is, 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 is sweet. But there's a shadow side of, of, of Venus also, uh, because you don't, get, uh, you don't get the good without the bad. And in fact, some of you may know Thomas More, the guy who wrote all the soul books, Care of the Soul and Soulmates and the Reenchantment of Soul in Everyday Life and blah, 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 blah. Um, one of his, fir his first two books before he became popular, I think, are his most important books. Um, th his first book he wrote was called The Planets Within. Most people don't know this about Thomas More. And the subtitle of that book was called, what was, is, The Astrological Psychology of Marsilio Ficino. That's a mouthful. Ficino was uh, the astrologer to three generations of Medici's. He's considered the quiet, silent architect of what we call the Florentine or the Italian Renaissance in the late 1400s. That's another story. But his other book that he wrote before he became famous was a book called Dark Eros. And it was about the shadow side of Venus um, that we like to think about infatuation and love and sweetness. But, but there is a much heavier and deeper and darker side um, of, of Venus and Thomas More's um, concept, and this is something that's, I think, acknowledged in most depth psychologies, is you don't get one without the other. If you're just living up in this everything is sweet realm, you're not getting the true sweetness unless you can bring in the full spectrum. Um, all right, where was I? Huh? Ah, Venus, oh, the personal planets. Okay, Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Okay, so now we know how we think. We know what we like. Mars is how we get it. 
Mars is how we define boundaries. It's still personal, but it's where my personal meets your personal. Mars is the god of war, but it's also, um, in ancient astrology, Mars was connected with Aries, the fighter, and with Scorpio, the lover, the intensity, the intimacy. But in modern, in modern astrology, when Pluto was discovered in the 1930s, Pluto was given to Scorpio, which kind of demoted Mars to only fighting, and Pluto gets to do the deep stuff. It doesn't really work that way. But the point is that in February, the three personal planets, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, as they all move from Capricorn into Aquarius, all have a meeting, a conjunction with Pluto. And, and this becomes why February is so much of a power surge, because not only is Pluto in this new sign of Aquarius, but is being personalized as each of these planets line up with it. And that's all I want to say about that. The other important thing about February, though, is that all the planets, and when astrologers use the word planet, they include sun and moon, because to the Greeks, the word planet to planeta meant a wanderer. And anything that wasn't a fixed star was considered a wanderer. And so it's not like we don't know better now, but sun and moon and even Pluto are you know, considered to be planets, anything that moves in the sky. So all the real planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, hell, you know, uh, uh, Chiron, Eris, Make, Make, Sedna, Pholos, uh, Chericlo. I mean, NASA tracks some quarter of a million things going around the sun that we don't even pay attention to. Anyhow, everything that's a real planet goes retrograde, meaning it looks like it goes forward and backward as Earth is moving around the sun the planets have this optical illusion of traveling forward and backward, retrograde motion. Retrograde motion is in it, let me do that again. Retrograde motion is important because it gives the planet extra power and intensity. The ancients didn't like retrograde motion. Traditionally, planets that are retrograde are considered bad. Uh, don't sign a contract, don't travel when Mercury is retrograde. Be careful about who you bring into your life when Venus is retrograde. When Mars is retrograde, often wars break out. Not that there's ever a time when wars are not breaking out. And not that there's a time ever when travel doesn't screw up. But the point is that the, that the ancients felt that retrograde planets were bad. Why? Because they lived in a one-dimensional world. You were born into a place, and that's what you had to do. So if you had a planet that was retrograde, planets go retrograde when they're closer to the Earth. That's, that's when we lose perspective. And in fact, when a planet is closer to Earth, just like a radio station, it's louder. And if you have a planet that's louder and there's no way for you to express it, that makes you crazy. I mean, if you were a woman growing up uh, 300 years ago or, or 500 years ago, um, and you had a very active and brilliant mind, you might not have been allowed to read or to learn how to read. And so you might have had to sneak that, and you might have ended up being punished because of your strong um, Mercury. Uh, and that can be said with any planet. But in the modern world, when we have retrograde planets natally, it's our job to figure out how to take that extra layer of intensity and power and to work with it. When planets in the sky are moving retrograde, though, what happens is that they're covering old territory, meaning they look like they're going over areas that they've already been. And often we get a sense that we're not moving forward in our life as quickly as we think we should. In other words, there's resistance. But this is a very natural thing. And that resistance actually gives us time to incorporate what we've already accomplished or to build our structures. So when the planet goes direct, then we can kind of run with it. Because when planets are direct, there's less resistance. Why am I talking about this? Well, every planet, every real planet goes retrograde every year. In fact, Mercury goes retrograde three times every year because it's going around the sun inside of us. And every time it gets close to the Earth, it looks like it's going backwards for a few weeks, three weeks, actually. So it's not unusual 
to have a retrograde planet. It's not unusual to have planets that are retrograde in your birth chart. What is unusual is for all the outer planets to be retrograde at the same time. And because they've been kind of clustered in an area of the sky, um, um, we've had over the past few years, short periods of time when all the planets were retrograde. And in fact, going back to um, last autumn, it began I think in, in, in July, but August, September, October, um, all the planets were retrograde. And when I say all the planets, because Mercury, Venus, and Mars are on a different rhythm than the outer planets, they move in and out of that. But even in December, even Mercury was retrograde. It turned direct the beginning of January. The reason we're talking about this is that by the beginning of February, every planet was direct. No retrogrades after all the planets were retrograde. What does this feel like? It feels like shit's moving fast. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's new stuff happening because a lot of these planets are still moving through areas of the sky where they've already been, but, but there's definitely, a feels like things are freeing up and there's some movement forward. And we're going, and because Uranus was the last of the planets to turn direct just at the end of January, when a planet goes from retrograde to direct or direct to retrograde, it has to slow down and apparently stop, and it takes a while for it to gain speed. So it's going to take until March or April until these planets are really gaining speed and we can really feel it. But in February, we're getting this beginning of this, it's kind of an additional, an additional push onto this power surge that we're talking about as Pluto is moving into the futuristic, technologically oriented sign of Aquarius with Mercury, Venus, and Mars lining up with Pluto, and now all the planets are going direct. Are you with me here? Yeah. All right. So this is why if things seem like crazy or out of control or like why bother, everything's totally fucked up and this why bother, you know, trying to, it's, everything has its time and its place. And those feelings are real. I mean, there's a lot of people that I've been encountering, and I'm sure you have too, that are just overwhelmed by 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 what overwhelmed with what's happening. By with what's happening. I don't know, whatever, however you say that. Um, okay, so February is is significant for those for those reasons, but there's another thing going on that I, it really has to do with 2024. As, as, as an entity. And that is, we're coming up to another gate that is incredibly unusual. Um, and I, just so I don't mess up on the dates here, I got way too many sheets of paper with different dates on them. Um, but, um, you know, we ha we've had Pluto that just changed signs from Capricorn to Aquarius, which it only does, you know, every you know, 15 to 35 years, depending on where it is in its cycle, because it's such an elliptical orbit. But over the next couple of years, we're going to have all the outer planets change signs. And this is unusual for it to happen in such a short amount of time. In other words, we've had Pluto just change signs, but Neptune is moving toward the end of Pisces, Neptune spends about 14 years in a sign. And Neptune will move into Aries um, at the end of next year. And then it kind of goes back and forth between Aries and Pisces. But by 2025 into 2026, Neptune is in a new sign, Aries. Saturn, which is moving through Pisces, Saturn only spends two and a half years in a sign. But it turns out that Saturn moves into Aries at the same time Neptune does. And so we get a rare once every Saturn catches up to Neptune, um, I think about every 35 plus years, 36 years, something like that. And so we get Saturn aligning with Neptune as they're both moving into Aries, Aries being the first sign of the Zodiac. This is like a reboot. Okay, on top of that, Jupiter changes signs every year, no big deal. But on top of that, we have Uranus, 
which changes signs about every seven years because it's an 84 year cycle. And Uranus, which has been moving through uh, Taurus um, for about five years, six years now, um, Uranus will move into Gemini um, uh, mid-2025. So in 2025, we have Saturn, Uranus, um, and Neptune all changing signs, and Pluto still just barely tipped into its new sign. And this is huge. Now, we might be tempted to say, well, it doesn't get to be huge until 2025 and 2026. However, it's huge now because we're cleaning up old shit. Because once these planets leave the signs that they're in, we don't get to go back and do the stuff that we could have done, should have done, might have done while Pluto is in Capricorn. Remember, we still get a couple of months of Pluto in Capricorn in the end of this year. It's kind of like, it's kind of like being in, um, in sixth grade and everyone in your class goes into seventh grade and you get held back a year because you don't know how to read. Well, it's like Pluto is doing remedial training. And it's like all those things we didn't get quite right. And, and I think it's very important, and I'm not sure what this means, but I think it's very important, that Pluto goes back into Capricorn in September and it's back in Capricorn through Election Day in the United States, as if we still got to get the old stuff right. I, I don't know what that means. And I think anyone who, in the, who, anyone who can call the election and say what's going to happen is guessing. It, it, it's, you know, it, it, you don't know. Even if you know, you know. Even if you think you know, you're basing your projection not on astrology, not on your wisdom of political science. You're basing it either on your fear or your hope. <laughs> it's like, um, and and I think that that's really important because it doubles down once more on the idea of all the planets being at the end of signs, all the outer planets in particular, um, um, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, even Chiron, which moves into, it's been in Aries, it'll move into Taurus in that same period of time. The reason is we have work to do and we better do it uh, because we won't get another chance. Now, there are other things going on, and I addressed this in my February um, forecast about the dance between Jupiter, the planet of expansion, and Saturn, the planet of contraction, and how um, through mid-2023 and on through February, oh, that's now, of 2024, those two planets are kind of working together. And by the time we get to later in the year, um, Jupiter growth, opportunity, expansion, reward for the uh, work we've done, Saturn, the work, the contraction, the responsibility, that the dance between these two planets by the middle end of the year gets more and more difficult. And in fact, those two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, will square uh, 90 degrees, that's conflict, three times beginning in August, then right around Christmas, actually Christmas Eve, it's exact, and then through um, mid-June of 2025. And so I don't expect whatever the conflicts that are going on now, even if they, we might feel like things are moving forward, I don't expect them to resolve. In fact, I think things will, be get, will get more complicated in this uh, dance between uh, Jupiter, yes, uh, make it bigger, go for it, Saturn, hold it back, repress it. You know, there's that dance is going on, certainly globally. Um, the other, uh, not the other, another very significant thing in 2024 is Jupiter and Uranus are both moving through uh, Taurus. Um, in fact, if we look at the chart, Actually, we're almost done with this part of the presentation. We haven't even looked at a chart. Uh, this is a chart for, for right now. Um, there's no horizon in it because um, this is actually wherever you are on the planet. Uh, for those of you online, the moon right now is at 15 degrees Scorpio, 47 minutes. And that's the same for all of us. But if you look here, you can see that Jupiter at seven and a half degrees, seven degrees and 30 minutes of, of Taurus, 
and Uranus at, at 19 degrees and seven minutes of Taurus. Jupiter and Uranus are both in Taurus. Jupiter moves faster than Uranus. And if I move this forward um, one month at a time, now let's do this a week at a time, watch just Jupiter and Uranus. Don't be distracted by all that other movement which will occur. Jupiter is moving faster than Uranus, and you can see here that by April 20th, there's April 5th, um, by April 20th, Jupiter catches up to Uranus, and there we are on the 19th. They're both at the same degree, just minutes apart, and if I just move that a day or two past, there's Jupiter on the other side of Uranus. Do you see what just happened there? All right. Now, Jupiter takes about 12 years to go around the sun once, and in that time, Uranus has moved on a bit. So it takes Jupiter about 14 years to catch up to Uranus again and again and again. Jupiter is the planet, as I said earlier, of optimism, of confidence, of expansion. Um, Jupiter is like if you blow up a balloon, that's Jupiter. <sighs> that's, it, it makes things bigger. It's about our awareness. It's about learning new things. This is Jupiter, the planet of growth. Now, we can say Jupiter is good, and traditionally, um, Jupiter is considered to be a good planet. It's called the benefic, a good planet. But Jupiter without Saturn sucks. Um, cancer. I don't mean the sign cancer. I mean the disease cancer. Because unrestrained growth does not work. In, in fact, back to that image of blowing up the balloon, when you blow up the balloon and it begins to get fuller and fuller and it's harder to blow more air into it, that's Jupiter reaching Saturn because Saturn is the limit. Saturn creates the structure. The balloon gets really hard. And if you blow that balloon up too much, it explodes. That's Uranus. It pops. So yeah, the, the structure is gone. All right. So when Jupiter lines up with another outer planet, these are always major events. Jupiter lined up with Saturn, as it does every 20 years, creating the calendar artifact of the decade. Jupiter lined up with Saturn in 1880, 1900, 1920, 40, 60, 80, 20, 2000, and in 2020. Actually, Jupiter lined up with Saturn um, right around Christmas of 2020, right at the end of the year. And that was a particularly important Jupiter-Saturn alignment because although Jupiter aligns with Saturn every 20 years, every 200 years, it changes element. And it's called a grand mutation. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now. Just it was part of how important 2020 was, which, we, which began with a once every 35 year or so conjunction of Saturn and Pluto. That was exact the day the COVID um, um, first mortality of COVID was announced and the um, genome was, was announced from the Wuhan lab. Um, in China. That was the exact date of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction that opened 2020. But there were conjunctions throughout that year of Jupiter and Pluto, and then Jupiter and Saturn, as they all clustered in Capricorn. Remember Capricorn, where Pluto has basically been deconstructing everything? So since 2020, really since 2019, we've been dealing with this kind of the beginning of the ending of so many things that we thought were fundamental. Now, Pluto's moved into Aquarius. Jupiter and Uranus are now getting closer and closer together. And once every 14 years when they align, Jupiter, the planet of expansion, lines up with Uranus, the planet of Aquarius, that has to do with breaking through the old structures. Uranus is like when the lightning strikes, it releases the tension. Uranus is sometimes called the quantum planet because every astrologer will say, if they're looking at a chart and there's something that's strong Uranus going to happen, they'll say, oh, well, expect the unexpected. Think about that. <laughs> the fuck does that mean? <laughs> expect the unexpected. Come on. But that's what Uranus is. 
You know the lightning is, I, I'm a photographer. I can't tell you how many times in a storm I've said, I'm going to get the ultimate lightning shot. And I'm waiting and waiting and I'm looking and I'm, my camera is all set up, ready to click. And it happens over there. And I move my camera and then it happens where it just was. You know, it, with lightning, you can expect it, but you never know when and where it's going to strike. This is kind of how Uranus works. Uranus is about sudden breakthroughs. Um, and incidentally, um, uh, there's a strong Uranian influence that we're coming up to um, with the United States' birth chart and, um, and with the planet Uranus, that every time it cycles around um, back to where it was in the United States' birth chart, we seem to be at war. And I'm not saying that that's what will happen because there's many types of war and it seems that as much as anything, we are in the midst of a tremendous information war that may have physical you know, ramifications. I'm not making less of that. Um, but as Uranus moved through Gemini, like it will begin to in a couple of years again, um, this was the American Revolution. This was the time of the Civil War. It was the time of World War II. And, um, and it's coming back up to that again. However, on April 20th, when Jupiter lines up with Uranus, we can expect there to be major breakthroughs in technology that are surprises. Now, again, it's no surprise to me at all that when Pluto moved back into Aquarius, Elon Musk's announced the first successful implant of a microchip into a human brain. I don't know if anyone saw this last week. But this is a real event that's occurred that's allowing a human who was unable to move to communicate by just thinking a thought, by sending that to a device that actually um, has movement. Um, and this, again, is part of this larger wave where there will be a breakdown between what we think we call life and what we think we call machine. Uh, that's a, another rabbit hole, not for tonight. Um, but this period of April is going to be very important, not only because of the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, because, um, again, I, th th there's going to be some surprises in April. And even if we go back a little bit earlier um, in, in, in April, um, there's a couple of things. We have a couple of eclipses coming up, and I don't want to spend a lot of time um, on, on these, but um, we, we have an eclipse. Actually, my birthday is on April 6th, and on April 8th, there is um, a um, total eclipse that will be visible in the southern part of the United States. Uh, I know there are people who are going to Austin and uh, some other places you know, to, to see the eclipse. Um, but uh, look at that pile up of planets in, in Aries, because we have um, this uh, eclipse with the sun lined up with Chiron um, and Mercury coming through that area also. And this is really culminating a week later, a week and a half later, with that Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. So I imagine that when we gather here on, uh, on the first Friday in May, that we'll be talking about something in April that we can't imagine right now. And Jupiter-Uranus conjunctions um, are often brilliant breakthroughs where it's like the sky clears. There's some real potential. We have some real potential, not only in February, but through this year, as bad as things look out there, wherever out there is. Um, we have some real potential for healing and for major breakthroughs, but it's not going to happen without our individual work. In other words, what happens out there is a result of what happens in here in each and every one of us. And I don't mean each and every one of us here, you know, in, in, in Redmond. I don't mean each and every one of us watching this, you know, broadcast um, on the internet. I mean each and every one of us on the planet. And the more of us that, that take responsibility in some way, this is why 2024 is so important because as we move forward, and I'm just going to move this forward. Um, actually, what I want to do um, real quickly is go back to, I know this is moving crazy quick, but I want to just go 
just for a quick moment back to 1966, 67, 65, 66. Okay, so here in the summer of 65, well, this, this is actually April, we can see that Uranus and Pluto are coming together. Uranus moves faster than Pluto. Uranus only catches up with Pluto once every other century. Well, it depends. Depends on how fast Pluto is moving. It can be, it can be about 100 to 150 years. But Uranus lined up with Pluto in the mid-60s, and every astrologer knows that what we call the 60s was an artifact of Uranus and Pluto aligning with Saturn opposite them. And Uranus, the planet of releasing built-up tension, and Pluto, the planet of everything that's hidden, the bacchanalian, the, 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 uh, the unconscious mind exploding out into the real world, that this was a function of what was occurring during, during the 1960s. Now, so here we can see the Uranus-Pluto conjunction of the mid-60s. If we move this forward, I can do this a bit faster. If we move this forward to about 2015, we can see now, and this gets lost because there's so many other things going on here, that Uranus is 90 degrees or square to Pluto. And the square in astrology is the ultimate conflict and an opening square, that's the square that happens after the conjunction. Like when at a new moon, the sun and the moon are lined up. A week later, it's the first quarter moon, and, and, and that's the moon squaring the sun. The opening square of any two planets in their cycle is considered to be a crisis in action. It, it looks back at what happened at the conjunction, and it says what's, what's worth keeping and what's not. And during this 2015, 2016, 2017 period of time, as Uranus and Pluto moved in and out of that exact square, we saw a reactivation of those things that never really went away, but kind of disappeared from public consciousness that were big and important in the 60s, whether it was civil rights, whether it was uh, uh, the use of personal drugs, whether it was uh, the, uh, the wave of feminism that occurred in the 60s, and then the uh, legalization of, um, of, uh, gay, um, of gay marriage and the uh, Black Lives Matter, and I mean, all these things, um, there were people revolting and demonstrating on the streets again. This was uh, 2015, 16, uh, it was Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street. And, and so many of those issues, and I'm not even touching on all of them, that's not the purpose of tonight, but the purpose is to understand this larger cycle of Uranus and Pluto and to see how the mid-2010s were basically a reactivation of what happened back in the 60s, in the 1960s. Why is this significant? Well, because as we move forward into the latter 2020s, what we see is that Uranus, as it moves into Gemini, is going to make a trine with Pluto. Trines are harmonious. Conjunctions and squares are conflictive and complicated and, and demand attention. But trines just allow the energy to flow. And we can see here that during this period of time of 20, beginning really just on the uh, kind of almost beginning now that Pluto has moved into Aquarius, but really beginning in later 25, 26, 27, um, Uranus trining Pluto is going to allow for a flow of energy between the Iranian breakthrough technology, sudden change, um, uh, revolution, shock, surprise, all these are Uranian words, and Pluto, the deeper evolution. So I know a lot of astrologers saying, oh, this is going to be a really cool period of time when Uranus is trying Pluto because everything's going to settle down. And I say, that's true. We don't know how it's going to settle down yet. And there are scenarios that are pretty frightening as to how things can settle down. Repression, uh, fascism. I mean, that basically kind of prevents the... Uh, 
uh, uncertainty, so to speak. So again, it's so important, not only this month in February, but through 2024, and really even into 2025, but we're losing a bit of the opportunity that we have right now when things are still so much in flux. You know, in um, I don't know if any of you here are a metallurgist or do metal work of any sort, but you know that copper is a metal which is related to Venus. The ancients knew that all the metals were connected with, um, with planets. Copper connected with Venus is a metal of beauty. It's used in art. It's used in... Um, uh, but it's not, a, it's, it's not useful in war. Why? Because it doesn't hold an edge. It's, it, it's, it's malleable. It's beautiful, but it's malleable. So, and, and, and tin is very brittle, but it breaks. But when you mix copper and tin and you heat it up, as it cools, it creates bronze, which is an alloy. And once that bronze cools, it's harder than either the tin or the copper were. And it holds an edge, it holds its shape. The Bronze Age was very important. And, and in fact, one of the thing, one of the advantages that Rome had, because it got copper from Cyprus, matter of fact, Cupris was Latin for copper. Cyprus is where, you know, allegedly, this is where Venus was born from the sperm of Saturn, as the waves washed up on the shores of Cyprus, the mythology is that's the birthplace of Venus. But there was no tin. They had to go to England to get tin. That's why they conquered that whole area and built roads, was so that they could mix tin with copper to make bronze. What does this have to do with right now? Well, the alloy is going to solidify over the next few years. And once it does, we're not gonna have the flexibility that we are complaining about right now, but we have. You with me? Got it? So, um, you know, there are other significant events in 2024, but there's so many people online, and I'll do this month by month covering the specific dates. Encumbering us with dates is not as important as knowing where we are in the process of this big shift and why 2024, 2025 are so important because we are in the beginning of the ending of whatever the transition was that began back in 2020. And that feeling of 2020, 2021 of nothing happening and everything being stuck you know, kind of as the march of 2020 that never ended. Um, in a way, we're now getting inklings that things are moving. And they may not be moving ultimately in the direction that we want them to move. And it's really important for us to engage however we might engage, whether it's simply talking to people, whether it's learning about things that we didn't know about, whether it's actually becoming involved politically or some sort of activist, whatever, whatever your you know, best relationship with the outer world is, it's important. But it's important that we just don't go quiet because if we do, by the time we reach this 2027, 2028, look, when things solidify and that bronze becomes you know, uh, immovable or unchangeable, there's going to be, no matter what your individual issues are, there are going to be issues that you're not happy about. Because you could, every one of us could probably take maybe five issues that we think are important in our personal lives or out there. And I would say that, that we would have overlap with a lot of other people. And yet I might feel this way on this issue and you might feel the same way. And on another issue, I feel this way, but you feel that way. And on another, and, and it's very complicated because there appears to be such bifurcation, such extreme separation. And here's the thing. It's likely that half of us in the world are not gonna be happy <laughs> with some things that solidify between now and then. So, get off your lazy asses and do something about it. And I'm not really saying that to you any more than I'm saying it to me. We all have our role and our part to play. One other thing I do want to mention, though, about um, 2024 is that in May of 2024, 
um, a couple of so we talked about the April thing and the eclipse, um, um, actually two eclipses, and um, and also um, the Jupiter Uranus conjunction. The other thing that that in May that begins to happen is that's the first round um, um, of. Um, Hello. <laughs> I don't know. I think it, I think it's someone trying to message me or something. I have no idea. I'm ignoring it. Uh, obviously not completely. Um, so the other thing that happens the beginning in May um, of this year um, is that Jupiter, which spends about a year in each sign, moves from Taurus. Remember, it catches up with Uranus in, in, in April 20th. But by May 25th, Jupiter moves out of Taurus into Gemini. And here we're going to feel that energy of, 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 of communication, of excitement, of movement, because Jupiter in Gemini is, 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 is more curious, wants to grow every which way. And we'll feel that. We'll talk more about that when we get to May and the shift between um, Jupiter in Taurus, which looks at opportunity, Jupiter's opportunity, but it only takes those opportunities that feels determined and grounded. And so Jupiter is not thrilled about being in Taurus. Although it gets to where it's going, it doesn't go as many places. Once, Je once, once Jupiter gets into Gemini, it, it wants to go everywhere now all over the place and there's going to be a bit of a shift there and we'll and we'll we'll feel that but the other thing that that happens starting in um in june is and i mentioned this earlier is that the dance between jupiter expansion saturn contraction which again they were joined around christmas of 2020 and through 2023 24 they they reached a point where they were sextile, which is they're working together. By June of this year, June of 2024, they reached that 90 degree angle. And we can see the conflict now beginning, becoming more, it's almost like battle lines are being drawn. And I don't even mean necessarily limited to political. There's a sense of just the, how do I go forward? How do I hold what I have? What's the dance that I need to do that, that doesn't have me pull in out of fear and shut down to hold on to the status quo to go back to some place in the past that I think was safe. I mean, you know, that's what Make America Great Again is built on this Freudian concept of infantile regression, this belief that when shit gets bad, we want to go back to the past where it was great. When it wasn't great, you know, you know, we were getting beat up as a three-year-old and we don't remember, whatever. I'm not, you know, the point is that as, Jupiter and Saturn begin to make this square, and they'll do it three times um, beginning in August of this year, then around Christmas, and then through next summer, um, or, or, or actually late spring. And at the same time, um, Jupiter is also going to be making a square and a half with Pluto, because it's actually, I think we can look at this best if we do this on, on online, are on, on the chart here, that um, if we bring this back to where we are now, um, we can see that, well, it's hard to see with all, all this other stuff here. Um, let's just see if I can do this real quickly to show you what I'm... So what, what's happening is that there is a half square forming between Jupiter and Pluto. I'm sorry, between, there's a, uh, okay, hold on, we're gonna get there, there we go. There's, there's a half square forming between Saturn and Pluto. Saturn, Pluto is going to be making a half square beginning a little bit later in this year. We can see that right about there. There's the Saturn to Pluto half square. And at the same time, Saturn will be moving into um, a half square on the other side. Um, Saturn is moving a half square to, to Pluto, while it's also, 
moving, well, well, it's also moving into a half square with Jupiter on the other side. This actually takes another month to perfect, but we can see it um, uh, June, July. Uh, it's not showing here. It's okay. Saturn makes that half square with, with Jupiter. Now, what this means is that, again, those things that began back in 2020, January 2020, at the Jupiter, Saturn, and Saturn-Pluto conjunction in, through 2020 are going to be coming to some conflictive stage here. Now, intriguingly, this is right around election time in the United States. And so it doesn't take being an astrologer to look forward and going, this election is not going to be pretty. I mean, no matter what happens. Uh, and, and I have to say, and I'm going to say this out loud here right now, um, that for about a year, I've felt something. This is not based on astrology. It's not based on any political prowess that I have. But there's a part of me that doesn't think that either Trump or Biden will end up being on the political ticket for president. Yay! Now, I, I have no idea. I have no idea whether that's true. And I'm not saying this to stir up anything. Um, but but come December, if that happens, I'm going to say, see, I knew that. I don't, I don't know that. It's just, it's just a hunch. Um, th there's a lot that can happen. And, and, and I think it just comes back to the, the point that I made earlier, that anyone who thinks that they know what's going to happen doesn't, period. It, it's, uh, it, again, when you're mixing the copper with the tin, it hasn't begun to take form yet. And we don't know what that form is going to be. And the form that it takes is going to be largely a result of what each and every one of us do now. In the last book that Carl Jung wrote before he died, a book called The Undiscovered Self, think of Pluto, the undiscovered, the unknown, the uh, underworld, the unconscious. Um, in this book, The Undiscovered Self, uh, Jung said that no amount of political intervention or treaties will ever create world peace. The only way that world peace will be achieved is by the res resolution of the conflicts of all the minds of all the people in the world. This is Mahayana Buddhism 101. <laughs> Mahayana Buddhism basically says, when it comes to enlightenment, no one gets off till everyone gets off. <laughs> So Mahayana Buddhism uh, reframed by, by Jung and re revisited by us here now. This is why we need to do something that, you know, move, move forward. Um, I, think, I think that's probably more than enough for now. Um, I, I hope that made sense to you. It was a little bit of a departure from what we normally do with the day-by-day -day charts. But I think sometimes, you know, there, there's this Virgo piece of astrology where we lose the sense of the forest for the trees, or sometimes we get so focused on the veins on a leaf of a tree, you know, that we forget that there's a tree, no less a forest. And I think sometimes it's really important to just step back a bit and look at this grander sweep of things so we can see it, it, it's like being a caterpillar. Not that I'm suggesting that any of us knows know what that's like, but, but it's just like being a caterpillar. Um, in a cocoon, and everything is melting down, your skin is disintegrating, your eyes are melting, and, and yet there's something about that process that is absolutely beautiful, magical, and healthy. And yet if the caterpillar had an ego like we do, there's no way that it would ever get into that cocoon just because the ego is about holding on to whatever it is that you think you are. And we're at that stage right now. Um, my buddy Bruce Lipton talks about the biological um, uh, reorganization that occurs when systems get too complex. That it, when, when, when the complexity reaches a certain level, systems break down and then it reforms on a higher level of integration, which is what happens if you open up a cocoon after the, after the caterpillar disintegrates and before the butterfly recreates, there's nothing there. It's just black gunk, you know, brownish, gooey, bleh. Um, and so the question becomes, and this is a question that I've had long discussions with, with a number of people. It's a fascinating uh, question. The question is, 
is there any way to get a message into the caterpillar while it's post caterpillar and pre butterfly just to let it know that it's okay? <laughs> because that's where we all are. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's where we are. And, and, and in fact, without opening up another whole rabbit hole that I would love to go down with you all sometime, um, that's what the teaching of the Tibetan Book of the Dead is. The Tibetan Book of the Dead is basically, in, in Tibetan, it's called Bardo Thodal, which really translates into um, in, enlightenment or liberation by hearing things that allow you to recognize what's going on. Hearing through, uh, a liberation through recognition by hearing. The thing is, the important word there is recognition, which is recognition. You can't teach someone who's in the state of meltdown of crisis as to what's going on unless you've talked about it before the crisis so that in the middle of the crisis you go, hey, Joe, Mary, this is exactly what we talked about. Remember, you're here now. Remember that? Con oh, I do. Yes, I get it. Because then you can connect to it. To so you can connect it to something. But you can't teach the complexity of it while we're in the midst of it. And although we've been in shades of the midst of it, in the, in the midst of it, like during the quarantine period of time, um, which whatever that meltdown period was, people's experiences vary so so greatly but something happened then but there was no way you could deal with what was happening then by by looking at what was happening then <laughs> you had to look at a larger trajectory of patterns and resonance and history to to get it framed into a larger place and that's why we've taken that step back over you know over this evening to understand why February is so important, but why 2024, 25 is so important and why 2020 to 2030 is so important. Astrologically, these are those interesting times that the Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times intended. That's it for now. Thank you all. We're gonna take about a 10 minute break and I'm gonna come back and do a couple of charts. I didn't bring my slips of paper that normally have where you write your name and stuff on. So if you never had your chart done, just take a small piece of paper. Uh, if it's bigger than, than a business card size, forget it, just rip it off a bigger piece of paper. And, and if you've never had your chart done and you wanna submit your name, um, you, we need, what's that? Yes. Yeah, toss them to someone over here. All right, we now have slips of paper on this table and, um, and there's going to be my hat. And uh, you, what we need is your name, your real name. I will not use your last name online. I'll only use your first name, but your name, uh, your email address, uh, your birth date, place, and time of day, a.m. and p.m., birth, date, place, and time. Then I'll draw three names, and we'll take a quick look at charts just to show you how this works in real time. Um, uh, a couple of other things. Uh, you know, I, I do this for free, basically, to keep this awesome place going, to do my little part. Um, however, if you want to contribute something, do it at the register. It doesn't go to me. It goes to the fund that keeps these kinds of events going here because there is a real cost to it for soul food. On top of that, the best thing that you can do is vote economically, not just tonight, but buying from individuals rather than nameless, you know, box stores, corporations, whatever. And by that token, by that same token, there's a lot of very cool things here. If you have a birthday, or something coming up, look around, buy something, spend a little money, spread your vote by, by spending money here. And I'll see you all in about 10 minutes. And I'm sure I forgot something, but that's the way it goes. Oh, and thank you all for coming out. And for those of you online, uh, we're gonna mute the mic. I'll be back in about 10 minutes and, um, and we'll pick up and do some interpretation. And um, what? What, speak. Is this
What? Oh, all right. That no, that was that. That's a plant. <laughs> um, okay. So um, and, and um, also, um, um, where's Natalie? No, not that Natalie. The stranger Natalie. Are you here? Oh, all right. So we we, ha we have Natalie here this evening from the stranger who's putting together an article about astrology and, and, and astrology in Seattle. And, um, and if you have anything you want to say, say it to her. She'd like to talk to everybody all at once. <laughs> all right, I'm going to set the microphone down. For those of you online, we'll be back in about 10 minutes. And everyone here, if you've had enough of me, this is your time to slip out with my blessing. And for the hardcores, we'll do another round. Thank you. That would be lovely. I have the, the proverbial hat. Sam, pick one or two. Oh, Jesus. No, just one or two. All right, one more. All right. Whoops, hand me that one. Thank you, Rick. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We're going to get started here again. And these are the real hardcore. All right. And the first winner for $10,000 in cash and a brand new 2024 Ferrari, we have Paula. Wait, yeah. Oh my God. All right. We have uh, Paula born January 16. Is that you? All right. So. I'm going to put each of these in one at a time, and we're just going to kind of take a run through how this stuff works in real time, as if any time is real. Um, all right, so we go here, and we go Paula, and I always go SF for soul food. And then this is a January 16, 59 at 3.20 a.m. in, oh, Portland. I thought, what the, where the hell is poor hand? <laughs> but the TL looked like, uh, never mind. All right. So, Paula, do you do you know your chart, or do you play a, a little bit? What, what do you know about your chart? Tell us something. Uh, I know I'm a Scorpio rising Aries. All right, that's enough. <laughs> Um, Can you share your screen on Zoom? Well, what am I doing? Share your screen on the Zoom. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so here we're going to go to Zoom and share screen. And we're going to do that should work.
All right. So we have in front of us, we have the chart for Paula. And what I like to do, and in my apprentice program, when I teach chart interpretation, I have this thing that Aries seem to have, and I call it first shot, best shot. In other words, when you look at a chart, what stands out? And this is not about any practice of going and talking about the sun and then the moon and then the ascendant and whatever. It's just you look at a chart and what zaps you. And um, I have this set up in solar fire so that the aspects that are the closest are the fattest lines. So I can see that Mars square Chiron is the closest aspect when we're looking at the traditional aspects here, because you can see how close that line is. And it's 20 degrees of Taurus Mars to 20 degrees, actually 20 degrees, 45 minutes to 20 degrees, 48 minutes. That's nailed. That's really, really close. And it's also close to the um, Chiron um, sextile to the moon. So I'm going to immediately think that Chiron is playing some important game in your chart, that there's some piece of, of that. Um, Chiron is often known as Chiron, the wounded healer, as if the is its middle name and wounded healer is its last name because it's all said as Chiron the wounded healer. When in fact, that was part of Chiron's job, but Chiron was the original teacher, was the original mentor. In mythology, Chiron taught Hercules and Asclepius and, and it wasn't just about healing, it was about, it was about healing through learning what was important. And, um, and so, when I see Chiron important in a chart, meaning that it's making two of the closest aspects, there's some aspect of um, Chiron in Aquarius as, you know, you either being a teacher or having some either ancient or old or personal or family or cultural wound that becomes part of what it is that you're in some way um, trying to make better or help or heal others or heal or solve your own issues, the moon in Aries. Um, okay, so the, where I go with all of this is that although that was the first thing I noticed, I now see a thing that kind of becomes the pattern. And the pattern is that you have Jupiter rising in Scorpio. Traditionally, Mars is at home or is the traditional ruler of Scorpio. And the way many astrologers would say is Mars is the chart ruler. That's incorrect. It's actually Mars is the horoscope ruler. And people go, well, isn't horoscope the chart? And the answer is no. In ancient astrology, the horoscope meant the hour marker, just like a microscope means seeing the small, a view of the small, a telescope, scope is, is to perceive or to see, telescope is to see far away, horoscope is to see the hour. Your horoscope is your ascendant. It's the hour marker. And so it makes me crazy when people who I know as great astrologers, really great astrologers, who even are teachers of traditional astrology, would look at this chart and go, oh, well, Mars is the chart ruler. No, there's no such thing. Nothing rules the chart. It's the ruler of the ascendant. And in traditional astrology, the ascendant is incredibly important. It was considered to be the helmsman. It's the navigator of the chart. You know, we sometimes reduce the ascendant to how you seem to other people. Oh, the ascendant is your mask. Your, uh, uh, it's a Jungian term. It's your mask, your persona. Um, Stephen Forrest um, says that the ascendant is how you dawn on other people because the ascendant is where the sun rises. So it's the dawn. And it is all those things. I like to think of it as the dance we dance when we meet someone new. But in Vedic astrology, they remind us that the ascendant isn't just how the energy inside you comes off out into the outer world. It's also how the energy in the outer world gets in. In other words, your ascendant is, is the intersection of the inside and the outside. It's the, it's the point at which you're attached or that we are attached to the world in which we live. So it is incredibly important in your chart um, because you have Scorpio rising, Mars is important because Mars is the ruler. Um, that's a traditional word. I try to avoid that word because it's a colonial, patriarchal, 
you know, left brain, right hand. Mars doesn't rule. Mars is associated with is what I like to say, but that's just my thing. But Mars is going to be important in your chart because not only do you have Scorpio rising, but you have Jupiter, the planet of bigger, better, more, making that Scorpio rising even more. It's, make, it's, it's magnifying it. And then we look at your moon and your moon is in Aries and your moon is conjunct the nodal axis, which gives the moon even more power. And so we know that Mars is important in your chart, but your Mars is not as happy as some of the other planets because Mars in Taurus, it we're back to it, like Jupiter in Taurus. It gets stuff done, but it has to do it at a slower pace than it. Mars likes to hit that gas pedal hard. And in Taurus, it's scared shit of hitting the gas pedal hard. Even though you have an Aries moon and the feelings kind of come to the surface or you experience them, that Mars in Taurus isn't going to act on something unless, it's, unless it knows that it's at the right speed and going in the right direction. And in some ways, it's that Mars, that square Chiron, that I think becomes um, a, a, an important thing that feeds the rest of your chart. We look, there's a lot of Earth in your chart. Uh, I mean, you have... Um, Saturn and Mercury in earthy Capricorn. And of course you are a Capricorn sun. And in all honesty, it took me this far looking at your chart to realize that you are Capricorn because I get distracted with what it is that jumps out. But obviously being a Capricorn is really important. And the fact that Capricorn is at home, I'm sorry, being a Capricorn is really important and being and having Saturn in its home sign of Capricorn emphasizes again the earthiness and the determination of making sure that you don't build a house on shifting sand if you part of reaching the top of any mountain is picking a mountain that's not going to be washed away in the next rainstorm and so there's that whole idea of the capricorn's mastery of the outer world begins with its choice of what it builds its foundation on and so a combination of that and the fact that the Mars, even though it's obviously tightly squared to Chiron, is also trying your sun. That doesn't show as loudly because I have these lines so skewed toward the, you know, toward what's exact to stand out. But Mars trying sun is important because actually this would suggest to me that even though you are emotionally reactive, that often people don't really know how it is that you're reacting because the Scorpio rising, even with Jupiter there, gains its power, not by what it says, but by what it doesn't say. And there's something about that the energy that is held in until it's the right time, right place that I think be, becomes Im important. Um, and then we have Venus opposing Uranus, which is you know a little bit of crazy making. And I don't mean that in a clinical sense, but you know I mean that um, so, okay, so we see that the earthy planets, the Pluto um, uh, in Virgo, Earth Virgo, trining Saturn and Mercury, and the Mars trining the Sun, that there's a lot of drive for stability and for endurance and longevity. And yet, the Moon in Aries connected with the South Node and the Venus opposing Uranus basically needs an extraordinary amount of freedom. And it and and that basically becomes, I think, the relationship or a relationship dilemma, because you need to be in a relationship that A has stability and B has flexibility. So is this making sense to you? How are we doing? Excellent. All right. I think I should stop at excellent. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's nowhere up to go. Um, um, okay. So one thing here that I think is really important and significant to note, and that is if we look at this chart from a different perspective and we um, put on this chart, do 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 uh, we put where the planets are today, we can see that Uranus in its 84-year cycle is right now tickling, well, maybe that's, it, it's tickling. Uranus is tickling your Mars like lightning tickles a lightning rod. <laughs> there, I would imagine that, and that if we move this backward, um, let's let me just make this a little bit bigger and get this out of the way here. 
Um, if we move this backwards a couple of months at a time, we can see that going back to, oh, yeah, actually going back to 2022, Uranus and Mars were moving together. And in the summer of 2022, there was probably some, some energy that was around either change or work or other people in your life because that Uranus and Mars together were coming up to where your natal Mars is and therefore squaring your natal Chiron. But then Uranus turns direct or turns retrograde and it doesn't actually reach um, your natal Mars until uh, roughly June of this year, June past. So May, we're looking at May and June of, of 2023 when Uranus lining up with your Mars is creating some sense of urgency or something happens that in some way stirs stuff up that that um, has to do with that sense of freedom or the sense of awakening or or something. Can you relate to anything? I'm not going to ask you to tell us what it is, but is there anything that you can think of from back around last May, May, June? I'll have to think about that some more. It's not coming to me. Okay. Because I'm suggesting that that would have been a time where things were beginning to stir up and then Uranus retrograded back over that same point back around between Thanksgiving and Christmas of 2023. And now that Uranus is turning direct or turned direct, Uranus is right back at that same spot again and between now and the beginning of April. So we have a couple of months that I think that can shake up the world of how you go for what, how you, how you head towards whatever your goals are. It's about, it's about how you move forward in life. And because this is in the sixth house, one might suggest that it could be health or job work related, but it's close enough also to the descendant, the opposite point of your ascendant, that it may also in fact relate to other people in your life. But there's something here that I think is, um, you know, is, is, is a shock, surprise, awakening, something new um, that may be coming into your life. You may have a sense of what this might be or what you might hope it to be or what you might hope it isn't. And I don't know it'll ultimately be any of those things. But if you're around come, uh, I mean, around meaning here, I don't mean living. If you're around here, you know, come May or June, hopefully you'll tell us what it is that either happened or didn't happen. Does it make any sense? Yeah, I'm a little scared now. But... Well, nothing to be scared of. It's exciting change. Okay, so the Taurus part of you doesn't like excitement. We get it. The uh, Earth part of you doesn't like excitement. And yet that Venus opposed Uranus is always looking to stir up some excitement even it's like when things get too boring i can't imagine you just kind of going with it that you know there's something there's some part of you that likes the the dynamic energy that even though it can be a pain in the neck you're attracted to it yes no maybe yeah that's it hope that made some sense these are these are q and d's quick and dirties all right next we have rael is that a name right is that did i say it right Rael, cool name. Is that a birth name? Yes. Were your parents on drugs? <laughs> Not kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to go. That's a cool name. I like it. Um, not that that should matter to you. Um, 12, 27, 1990. At 8.15 a.m. And we're in La Grande, Oregon. Whoops. Has an E on La Grande. Oh, you already had that, but I didn't. And do you know your chart? You, what's your deal with astrology? Yeah, I've been, I've been studying with Stephen Forrest. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm Stephen Forrest's younger, smarter brother. I actually, actually... Um, I, actually, Steve and I were born three months apart, um, and he is a Capricorn with an Aries moon, and I am an Aries with a Cancer moon opposed his son in, in Capricorn. Um, and uh, 
And I could tell stories for way longer than any of you want to hear about people. Other people know who Stephen Forrest is, a well-known astrologer, uh, um, a wonderful guy, um, and, and a very uh, someone who's contributed a lot to the astrology world. And Stephen and I consistently get mistaken for one another because we're both silver-haired, you know, aging hippies. And although when you put us next to each other, we're we're, we're substantially different, um, but um, I've threatened legal action against him um, because when I go to Facebook, um, it automatically wants to tag my pictures as Stephen Forrest. Um, but I mean, I've stood in an elevator where someone came up to me and handed me one of Steve's books and said, and said to me, Steve, would you sign this? And I sign it, I'm not Steve. <laughs> Rick Levine and hand it to Steve, who I was talking with standing right next to me. Um, and, you know, and Stephen gets the same thing. So we, we, um, yeah, it's one of those things. Okay. Enough of Stephen Farr. There, there's some good, there's some really good stories of a little bit of craziness um, there though. All right. So Rael, we have an entire universe of planets in Capricorn. Okay. Um, so, um, um, yeah, it appears now that, that Paula was just our Capricorn warm-up act, <laughs> um, because you have Sun, Uranus, Neptune, Venus, Saturn, and the North Node all in Capricorn. I can only imagine that you're one of those people that is not sad to see Pluto move into Aquarius um, because pretty much since 2005, six, seven, certainly eight, nine, 10, when, when it reached your son, I mean, you know, for, for someone who is, you know, uh, what, um, 90, 2010, 20, what, you, you're, you just passed the Saturn return. So you're at 30, 30, 33 years old. Um, you've had more more Pluto transits than most people get in an entire lifetime. And one then might assume, uh, and I say assume because with astrology, as astrologers largely um, share something uh, with people who practice any form of fundamental religion or scientists or even Western medical doctors. And that is astrologers tend to think they know more than they know. And so I say assume because I don't know, but one might assume that you've had a lot, that, that the Rael who shows up here today is quite different than the um, Rael of you know, 10 or 15 years ago um, because Pluto has gone over you know, um, not only your sun, but so many of your planets. And I have to say that on some level, it probably or might not have been as difficult as some people might think Pluto transits could be because of your moon and Mars in Taurus. Oh, we have another Mars in Taurus. Um, because as Pluto and even Saturn and Jupiter back in 2019, 2021, as they were all moving through late Sag and then into Capricorn, they were also trining, harmonizing with your moon and Mars. And so in a way, the caterpillar has become the butterfly. The meltdown in some way is complete. Not that change is ever complete, but I, I would say that on some level, when you're 40, 50, 70, 80, you'll look back and it'll be that period of time through the 2010s, or let's say through the 20, you know, 20, uh, oh, 05, 6, 7, 8 through 2023, that'll be the time in your life that'll be the rock and roll period of, oh my God, that's where it all happened. And this has nothing to do with age, even if during those ages, a lot of things happened, you know, through adolescence and early adulthood. Um, but that's, that's pretty profound. Um, and now that you're coming out of your Saturn return, um, which would have been pretty much complete by, you know, 2021, I mean, when Saturn moved into Aquarius, in some ways, that was the first wave of that completion. However, Pluto still had a couple of years of hanging out in Capricorn, making sure 
that the deconstruction of whatever you thought you used to be wasn't anymore. <laughs> Does this make sense to you? Yeah. So, wow. And, you know, again, we have a um, Mars trine. I think with, um, with Paula, we had um, Mars trining the sun in Capricorn. And in your chart, we have, well, yeah. And in your chart, we have um, Mars trining Saturn and widely trining Venus and certainly trining um, the, the North Node. And so in a way, again, we have this practicality of Mars, but your chart is a chart that that Capricorn stuff is incredibly potent, but there's nothing normal about the normalcy of Capricorn in your life. Why? Because Uranus and Neptune, not only Saturn in Capricorn, but Uranus and Neptune were also in Capricorn, which in a way kind of uh, destroys the box of reality that Saturn in Capricorn or that Capricorn normally has. Um, there's a part of you that doesn't need to think about how do you get out of the box because there's a larger part of you that doesn't know what the fuck a box is. <laughs> you know, it's like you're, you're past that. You're, it, it, it's, it's like either having to deal with people who are Uranian, eccentric, you know, other than, or feeling it from the inside out. And, um, and yet I'm not saying that would be all easy because there's still the, you know, the Saturn, um, the Saturn ruling the um, ascendant or the horoscope, the fact that there is this whole recognition of, you know, the rules and the laws and the tradition, even if you're more of a rebel than people might think when they first meet you, you know, you're, you know, you, you're, you're the proverbial person who can get by looking normal, <laughs> but we know the truth, <laughs> or at least we know part of it. And look how close the Chiron is in opposition to Saturn. Again, the teacher there, Mars being a significant point on that. Um, and yet Mars being a bit annoying, um, Mars, that thick green line is Mars quincunx um, or the Mercury quincunx to Mars. And so there's something here about how you can act and be contained even in your radicalness, but your mind is always looking to grow, always looking to explore the Mercury in, in Sagittarius, you know, is the forever student, whether you're in school or not, doesn't matter but it's the person who either wants to travel mentally, metaphysically, philosophically, spiritually, or physically um, versus the Taurus who says, no, I just want to stay here. Don't want to go anywhere. And I think that that's a constant ongoing irritation in your life. When you're here, you want to be there. And when you're there, you want to be here. Um, and again, I think that the important thing is to understand that whatever it is that went on through you know, the, in the two, I'm going to say roughly in the 2010s, you know, is, is, is over. That's history. And, uh, and yet also you have, like Paula, you have the Uranus and Jupiter coming up towards conjuncting your Mars, and that'll be over the next months and over the next year. And I think that'll be an important growth piece and annoying because it'll kind of emphasize the need to break out of the status quo while you're attracted to the status quo. Feedback, thoughts, share. Yeah. Oh, and then also uh, the Venus um, sextile Pluto. Um, this is significant with Pluto on the midheaven. You know, it, it's like I would say that there's a part of you that knows how to work the system, whatever that system is, and is not interested in the surface simplicity. In other words, it's not just the Capricorn who wants to get to the top of the mountain. It's the Capricorn because that Venus is sextile to Pluto wants to get to cap wants to get to the top of the mountain with the ultimate understanding of what the meaning of the mountain is and how the mountain was built and the fundamental underpinnings of it. This is not your chart is, I would say, especially with the moon in Taurus, as opposed to um, Paula's moon in Aries, that your chart and I'm not saying that that Paula is casual. I'm just saying your chart, even with the moon trining Uranus, there's a sense of eccentricity and a sense of doing it your own way, but there's nothing casual about your chart in general. And I don't mean just with relationships. I mean, with how you approach life in general, um, you wanna to get to the jugular vein. You wanna to get to what's real, yeah? 
All right. You are more than welcome. And last but not least, everybody says that. That's like a thing, right? Last but not least. Can't you be least and last? I'm not suggesting, Emily, that you are both. But can't one be? I'd love to hear someone say something. Now, last and least. It's never going to happen. All right, Emily, where are you? Emily? Do we have an Emily? Did Emily leave? Emily going once. All right, last and least, Emily. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> we'll see what, 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 what fell out here. How about Noah? Noah. Hi, Noah. All right. Noah. Noah without an H. How do you feel about that? Do you feel do you feel deprived? Do you feel like someone ripped you off? No, apparently not. We're not going to get anything out of Noah just a giggle. Okay, all right. This is a March seventeen, two thousand nine. All right. Um, and Silverdale, Washington. Oh no, five twenty-eight. Five twenty-eight a.m. And now we're in S-I-L-V-E-R-D-A. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try that again. S-I-L-V-E-R-D-A-L-E. -E -E. Try that. Silverdale. Wah. Noah, do you know your chart at all? Have you ever looked at it? Oh, yeah? And so your mom dragged you here? Pretty much. Well, you're lucky that your mom drags you to places like this as opposed to places that some moms drag us. Um, all right. First shot, best shot. First thing I see, because when any astrologer looks at a chart, the first thing that they see in any chart is their own chart. <laughs> you look at a chart and you go, ah, look at that planet's there. So is mine. You know, that's, that's, that's how an astrologer thinks. And I look at your chart, and the first thing I noticed, your Venus was at 13 degrees of Aries, which is where my Venus is. And don't take this wrong, Mom, but Noah, I love you. No, no. Because <laughs> Venus is the planet of love, and our planets of love are in the same place. Now, we are very, very different people, and obviously, it would never work out between us. <laughs> but... Um, the, there is something about Venus's being in the same place. What it does say is that on some crazy way, in some crazy way, we both have similar tastes as to what it is we like in the world. Even though we may be incredibly different in every other way, we both like things that are new. Because our Venus in Aries, it, 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 it's attracted to things that are exciting, whatever they may be. You know, whereas a Venus and Taurus may be attracted to things that are more stable and, and knowable and real. Um, and, and or Venus and Pisces may be attracted more to something that's more spiritual or more having to do with the sensitivity to things that are not apparent. Venus and Aries likes what's, um, you know, what's in the moment. And the thing is, is that your Venus and Aries is important because it's 13 degrees of Aries, that's fire, and it's harmonized in a trine with the moon at 13 degrees of Sagittarius. And it may not be apparent to you, but they're very closely both sextile to Jupiter, not at 13 degrees, but only a few degrees away, uh, uh, Jupiter at, at 16 degrees of Aquarius. And so we have a little pattern here with the moon in Sagittarius, Jupiter is Sagittarius's key planet, and your Jupiter is harmonized with the moon, which in turn is harmonized with Venus. And this is kind of a cool little beginning of, of looking at a chart, because it basically shows us the part of you that is upbeat and optimistic and engaged and, and, is, and wants to learn and wants to travel and wants to grow. And all those things are part of who you are. 
but it doesn't touch the fact that you're a weirdo. <laughs> Mom nodded yes harder than Noah. And, and why I'm saying that is be, because is a, a couple of things. First of all, from the first part of the discussion earlier tonight, we know that Aquarius is about the future. It's about the eccentric. It's about other than normal. Um, I knew an Aquarian man who actually passed away a number of years ago, and this guy was the ultimate Aquarian. Um, he, he owned a llama ranch um, in, in Oregon, um, and his llama ranch was a bed and breakfast. Um, but he was an astrologer, and he made most of his money by doing sex typing for um, llama breeders because, because um, female llamas are worth a lot more money than male llamas uh, because one male llama can inseminate, you know, the, the world or whatever. Um, but um, using the angle between the sun and the moon, he was able to, with a high degree of accuracy, um, create inseminations that resulted in, in, in the uh, birth of females rather than males. Um, and oh, and did I say he was a Nazarene a minister? No, uh, he was, and that he was also a licensed Montessori teacher, and he ran a Montessori school on his llama breeding ranch bed and breakfast. <laughs> and whenever you stayed at his place, you got to fly in his hot air balloon. <laughs> this and and this was an Aquarius, an Aquarian. All right. So Aquarians are basically are the license to be weird. Now, you were born with Aquarius rising, with the north node of the moon rising in Aquarius. And so you're basically, being weird makes you happy because that's what the, the, the north node is kind of our connection to the, the purpose that the soul has in this incarnation. In some ways, it's about the personality and, and the how you express that outwardly with Jupiter coming up right behind it. People meet you. They don't meet you. They meet the hi. I'm Noah without an H. <laughs> you know, there's, there's that upbeat side. And yet there's another weirdo part sitting behind all of this. And that is that you are ultimately a Pisces, which is more about sensitivity and emotion and compassion. Um, and, um, and with the planet Uranus so close to your sun, again, it's the, you have that weirdo-ness internalized. Um, do you do any sort of music or artistic expression? What music do you do? Um, I used to play cello. I still play. Say again? Uh, I used to play cello and I teach myself how to play fiddle right now. Cool. You, do you live around here or do you, are you living, whereabouts do you live? Uh, oh, well, that's not quite around here. Um, I just, I, I, I have a fiddle that was handmade by my grandfather. Um, that is just this extraordinary instrument. So, um, yeah, it, it, the thing, though, about your attachment to music or any of the arts, I mean, Pisces is ultimately musical because it's about field and vibration. And it's not just music. It's not just the music we can hear. It's the vibe. And with the Aquarius rising and, and the Mars and Mercury and Uranus and the sun all in Pisces, I mean, you're a person that... Basically, the vibe is what's important. Um, and, and, and I think that some of the creativity in your life has to do with the Saturn opposite all those Pisces planets, Saturn in, in um, Virgo opposite the Pisces planets, and squaring the moon. In some ways, there's, there's this drive to want to use Saturn to make things real. And that in relationship, and I don't necessarily mean romantic relationship. I mean, in relationship of you to your parents, to your siblings, to your teachers, to the outer world, there's that need of looking at the outer world to give you the structure that you need so that you can be as flaky and as unbounded and as weird as you can be. And, and, and that need for that structure is really, um, is really important. I think without it, um, that you might feel a bit, a bit, a bit lost. Um, I also think that starting last March, and this has nothing to do with age, starting last March when Saturn first moved into Pisces and lined up with your Mars, there might have been a heightened period of frustration back in last March about wanting to do something and can't, 
whether it's like you're not smart enough, you're not old enough, you're not tall enough, you don't have enough money, whatever it is, there's something that's preventing you from doing something that you want to do that in some ways when, when Saturn went retrograde, it retrograded all the way back to that same degree back around October of this past year. And that in some way there's that sense of frustration again of not being able to get to where you're going as fast as you want to. There's things that there's resistance, there's responsibility, there's work you got to do and you just want to go forward and you can't. Um, and I think that that both fortunately and unfortunately over the next couple of years as Saturn continues its move through Pisces, that you may end up feeling through this period of time. And there's other things going on. I'm just picking out this one thing. You may feel that weight of adults in your way <laughs> because that's actually what you need. Um, and again, it goes back to that caterpillar. How do you tell the caterpillar that it's okay when it feels like everything's being destructed? Well, we need mom to remind you. Remember when Rick said that you're going to feel like the whole world's against you or you feel like you really want to go on this trip to Europe, but you can't because you blah, 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 whatever it is. And, and you're going to feel like your whole world's falling apart because you can't do what it is you need to do. It's what you do while you can't do what you think you're not doing that you want to do that's going to be important. And so... Uh, and and the thing to keep in the back of your mind or to have mom around to remind you is that when you feel overwhelmed by the amount of restraint or constraint or restriction that you're feeling, and I'm not painting a negative picture over the next few years, I'm picking out the Saturn thing just because it's the most obvious thing that I can talk about, that it's important to understand that this is the time in your life when you're building that foundation that you're going to wish you had if you didn't in two or three years when Saturn moves out of, it, out of Pisces and all of a sudden you feel like, oh my God, <laughs> there are no adults telling me I can't do this shit anymore. Ah, and, and that will happen. Does that make sense a little bit? Anything you want to share with us or say or ask or... Saturn's a pain in the butt for you. It'll always, it, it, there's some part of you that, that I think always will feel a bit like, like you don't get to be quite as free as you feel. And that's okay because it's that dance that you do between, you know, the, this is where I want to do this. I want to go here. I want to go study you know, um, uh, a violin in Italy or wh whatever. Um, and they know you have to stay here and do this because, and it's that, that working that, that balance out between um, the part of you that doesn't see any restraints in the universe ever. And the part of you that's dealing with those restraints all the time. Mom, what do you got to say? A nutshell. <laughs> yeah, that's an Aquarian weirdo nutshell. Yeah, a Brazil nut, not 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 a walnut. No. <laughs> All right, I think that's probably probably it. And and with that, I don't know where Sam went to, but I, when Sam comes back. We will end the internet broadcast, and until then, I'll fill in with a couple of words about something. But I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Um, actually, I think I can end it right here. That's what I'm going to do. All of you online, thank you so much for attending. Um, I will have this as a permanent um, on YouTube for those of you who want to watch it or revisit parts of it. I'm going to stop my screen sharing and. Um, and we're going to all, without feeling the pressure to like being in a fire drill, having to leave immediately, we're going to acknowledge that the wonderful baristas have stayed here after hours as they often do. And if there's anything that we can do to help to, by clearing the space and helping put chairs back or whatever, we can do that. Otherwise, 
I will see you on the 1st of March, which I think actually March 1st is the first Friday of the month. I will be back here on March 1st. And until then, be safe out there. Think cosmically, act locally. We're done. <laughs>